All right, welcome to my latest project, a walk-in garden. A few months ago, I built a single raised garden bed to try my hand at gardening, but wasn't able to get very far with the trial because the deer in my area just ate everything I attempted to grow. That led to me looking at a fenced-in design. I wanted something where the fence was built into the planter boxes, and since I have plenty of big space, I kind of went overboard. Well, everybody else is saying I went overboard. I think it's fine. The idea behind the design is to be able to build one planter box, then join it to another that is built the same, giving you the flexibility to have a U-shaped space, an H-shaped space, or even a giant rectangle. If you would like to build your own, everything I used in this project is readily available at your local Lowe's Home Improvement, and everything is linked for you down in the description. I wanna say a big thank you to Lowe's for supporting my channel and sponsoring this video. All right, let's go ahead and get started on the building process. Wouldn't you just know it that whenever I wanted to start on my outdoor project, it would be rainy all week. The weather drastically affected the way I went about building these planters because instead of building them on location where they would end up, I built them all in my shop, stored them, then moved them out the following week when the sun came back out. With that, I utilized my shop's porch to cut down all of the material needed to start building the planter boxes. I'll be building 12 boxes for my layout, and I use my 3D modeling software SketchUp to first model the entire garden to generate a cut list. This allowed me to set up a stop block at my motor saw and cut all the pieces needed for every bed before moving on to the next length and repeating. Regardless of how big or small you go with this project, a cut list will drastically speed up the time it takes to build. The first day I started building, I only had my two by fours on hand. The rest of the material would be delivered the next day. So I first build all of the planners inside framing first. This will make up the bottom of each box and is a simple rectangle that's just like framing up a small wall. To speed up the process of placing each joist, I used a spacer cut to the right length to space them apart as I was placing them. After attaching one side, I repeated to attach the other. Of course, since I had 12 boxes, I made 12, setting each one aside after I was finished to reuse my large table and avoid working on the ground. The next day, I started off by receiving all of the other needed material for this project. Since it's so much material, I took advantage of Lowe's delivery service where all I had to do was place an order for how much I needed, then they loaded it up all nice and neat, delivered it to my workshop, then also offloaded it where I needed it to go. With my additional material on hand, I continued cutting up the needed boards by setting up a few more stop blocks on my miter saw. I cut small boards to make up the inside bracing pieces that will hold together the slat material. Then longer boards that will make up all of the feet. And just a tip for you, if you're cutting up a large quantity like me, place your cut boards in columns of 10 or 15s so that they're easy to count at a glance. After getting all of the next step pieces cut, I placed a frame back on the work table and started building onto it. First by adding the first row of slatted material all the way around the perimeter of the frame, then adding what will be the inside braces. With these in, it gives me a place to add the rest of the needed slat material that will make up the top of the planter box. Now I'm using treated material for this entire build, but before you say it isn't good for the food, treated material is now treated with copper and potassium instead of chemicals. And several studies have shown that it doesn't seep into plants growing in the soil. In fact, treated wood is actually FDA approved. Once the entire planter box was complete, it was time to start attaching the legs. And this is far easier to do with the box on its side rather than on its bottom. So I would move the planter down to my shop floor, then start attaching the legs. Okay, so one cool part of the design is that each box connects to the previous one. With that, each individual box only gets four legs attached at this point, because this one gets four legs here, then its remaining legs gets added whenever the neighboring box gets added to it. The front of the box gets short legs since it will be inside of the fence but the back of the box gets tall legs so that fencing can later be added onto it. I would start off by attaching the short front legs by clamping them in place with a strong holding Bessie clamp, then go to the inside and screw it in place. It's probably hard to tell on camera, but this thing isn't light. Treated material is great for holding up to the elements, but it's heavy right off the shelf until it dries. So instead of trying to build, then move it by carrying them, we moved a shop cart to set the box on, then attach the tall legs. 
This meant after the legs were attached, the entire heavy unit could easily be moved to the other side of the wood shop to be stored out of the way. Then I could repeat the entire process to start building out the next one. And let me tell you, by planner number 10, I was getting really worried about running out of room to store these beaks. But I did think it looked hilarious at the end of the day to look around and see a sea of planters. By the way, this is a huge project, so I brought in some help to help me knock it out. This is Jake. While I was building the main body of the planters, he was out on the muddy job site setting up all of the pavers in their location, taking the cut lug pieces and assembling them into their T or L shape, then also going back through and attaching joist hangers just to give each box's bottom a more sturdy bed. It is surprising how heavy 12 inches of soil is. The next day, thankfully the sun was finally back out and that meant it was time to start moving the planters to their location outside. The guys would use the car to once again transport the box out to the shop's porch so that whenever I moved it to its location, it would be facing the correct way and I just had to get it close enough to be set onto the pavers and then they can scoot it by hand to its exact place. Which is it not only lined up to the paver's edge, but also interconnecting to the neighboring planter box. This was as simple as slightly lifting the end without legs and placing it onto the end of the next one already in place then going to the inside to screw it all together. With the planters being so heavy, I placed my fork attachments on the bucket of my tractor and used it to pick up the planter and move it to its pavers. However, remember that building these directly on location is a great option if you don't wanna mess with moving them afterwards. You could build a quick and easy workbench on the job site to build them up off the ground, then have another person's help to move them down and onto their pavers. I built this garden directly on the south of my shop because I have a large open area there and it is really close to my new water collection tank which is what I'll be using to irrigate everything. And I'll tell you this, it saves a lot of time and mistakes to build it first in digital form before building it in tangible form. All right, with the planter boxes in place, it was now all time to finish skirting around the bottom. I designed it so that the outside will have slats running down to the ground so that smaller animals won't be able to just waltz right in. While I was working on the skirting, Jake was going around to the post and trimming them all level. It is far easier to leave the post tall than trim them exactly once they're in place. Once we were both done, we worked together to start building out the framing for the fencing. The first step in that process was to connect each tall leg with a two by four. This step goes quickly with two people because all the boards can be cut to length beforehand and then quickly thrown up. Make sure it's flush on top because the next thing is to add the top cap, which sits on top. You can determine the height of the fence needed on the garden based off of what animals you have around that you're trying to keep out. I have tons of deer where I'm at, so that's why my fencing is so tall. After the top trim and cap are in place, now it's the fencing. You can go with a wide variety of material here depending on what look you like as well as what animals you're trying to keep out. Once the panels are cut to the proper width, it's back to quickly achieving yet another step because they just fly going up. But this is most certainly a two person job because the fencing needs to be pulled or stretched to lay down tight and not have any waves in it. Jake would start off by stapling one side to the frame, then I would pull each section as much as I could so that he could staple it to the center member. Then we would rotate around and I would push while he stapled the last stretch on the right. For the planter bottoms, I debated on doing either plywood or slatting with wood, but Jake had a great suggestion of using metal roofing material. Since every sheet will need holes drilled in to allow water to escape, I drilled these while sheets were piled up on top of each other so that I could punch through them all at once. Then, since that went so well, I thought I would also try to cut all the sheets to length at the same time. I used the Diablo Steel Demon blade and it did not even blink an eye at cutting through 12 sheets at the same time. This blade is specifically designed to provide less sparks and also a burr free finish. So if you're cutting metal, I recommend seeking it out. Then before the bottom can go in, I also had to cut around those inside braces. And I did this with my Bessie 10 snaps. I would make a left and right cut, cutting a good ways around the brace to make it easy, then fold the flap up and out of the way. These don't look the best, but remember that the soil will cover them up. Then it can easily be picked up and plopped down in the bed. Then there is also the plastic. 
Even though treated wood is acceptable material for a garden bed, any wood choice will rot whenever it's constantly in contact with wet soil, even treated or cedar. So to prevent having to rebuild these prematurely, I also line the boxes with some pond safe plastic. I only mess with lining the sides of the bed since the metal is protecting the bottom. Okay, and I think that's it for the planter boxes themselves. So one of the last things to build was the gate entrance with the two doors. For this, I went to my wood shop in order to build the doors and they're built with simple but strong half laps at all of the connections. I started by placing each style of the door in my super jaws, then using my circular saw to make multiple cuts so that I could then come back with a chisel and knock out all of the pieces until it was flat. When it came time to cut all of the half laps in the cross braces of the door, I decided to try and gang cut them. The super jaws have a feature where you can flip the jaws around to drastically expand your holding capacity. I did that to hold every rail needed. I clamped two boards on the top and bottom to hold the faces flat to one another and then repeated with making multiple cuts with my circular saw. <laughs> and I am pleased to say that this worked. It saved me a ton of time by doing it all together rather than individually. All right, then to put things together, I used some waterproof glue, some Bessie clamps to hold things tightly together, and then a few screws to secure it permanently. Easy peasy. Now they could get screened in and then taken outside to get hung in place in the garden. Now, right inside of the doors is kind of a wasted spot. So to utilize it and make it functional, we threw up a few two by fours horizontally, then used the leftover five quarter boards to span across and make a makeshift table. Alrighty, and that is the build portion of this project complete. Now it's just on to the finishing touches. I chose to go with an eco varnish from Total Boat, and since this project is so large, I sprayed it on. This is a UV stable gloss finish that is water-based and dries very fast. It also doesn't require sanding in between coats, so I was able to get five coats on in a single day, which is extraordinary. If you're curious, it is a low odor and low VOC formula, and it cleans up very well with just soap and water. While I did come a long ways with the garden, I still have plenty to do before it's complete. In the center, I wanna do a much lower raised bed and dedicate the center to raspberries and blackberries. Remember that if you'd like to build your own, you can take the way of building one and joining it to another, then come up with your own size and configuration to fit your space and needs. I do have four options of plans that come with the material list over on my website if you'd like to check it out. Everything that I've used in the project is linked for you down below, and I would love to hear your comments on what you think about my new garden and a name. I feel like a garden this size should have a cool name, so if you have a suggestion, then let me know. That's it for this one, I will see you on my next project. <laughs>